The morning of January 17, 2001, was an ordinary Wednesday morning in Hutchinson, Kansas. Parents were at work and children were in school. It seemed to everyone in town that it would be another normal day. That would all change when an explosion occurred downtown at Decor, a party supply store, and the neighboring appliance store, Woody's. Initially, it was assumed that a local gas leak was responsible until three miles away, a geyser of mud and rock shot 30 feet into the air and natural gas began pouring out of the resulting hole. No one knew why the ground was erupting and there was no way of knowing where the next explosion might occur. Before it was over, parts of town would be evacuated and several people would be dead. This is the Hutchinson Salt Mine Disaster. Hutchinson is located in the heartland of America, in central Kansas. It has a population of approximately 40,000 people, which outside of nearby Wichita makes it one of the largest towns in central Kansas. Though Hutchinson is a relatively small town, it is well known for hosting the Kansas State Fair and housing the Cosmosphere Space Museum. However, this small town is also known as Salt City, based on the salt mines located 600 feet below the city. The salt mine covers 980 acres and stretches 150 miles if each chamber were arranged in a line. The salt was blasted and mined in a room and pillar mining fashion, removing large square caverns and leaving pillars to support the rock above in a checkerboard pattern. This produces rock salt. However, Cargill and Morton salt mines are also located in Reno County, where Hutchinson is the county seat. These mines use solution and evaporation processes that produce table salt and salt used by pharmaceutical companies, food processors, and agricultural and chemical businesses. The mine can be accessed by the Strata Museum, which is the only underground salt mine accessible by tourists in the United States. The salt mine also provides a natural preservation site. Housed in the salt mine are many artifacts, including the original camera negatives of Gone with the Wind and Ben-Hur, as well as other Hollywood artifacts and important historical documents. At no point did anyone think that the salt mines could lead to one of the most terrifying events in Hutchinson history, creating a mystery that would question the safety of the mining practices, the mine itself, and life in Hutchinson. On the morning of January 17th, Fire Chief Dill from nearby McPherson Fire Department and Fire Chief Patterson were in a meeting in the firefighter training office at 18 East B Street when an explosion shook the ground and rattled the pictures on the wall. The two fire chiefs ran outside to view a plume of smoke rising into the air just to the northwest. They didn't wait for an alarm or any emergency call as it was clear that their expertise was required. They jumped into their vehicles and made their way to the base of the now billowing column of smoke, signaling the need for their immediate assistance. An explosion rocked the party supply store and smashed the brick walls. The blast sent brick, rock, and debris out into the street. The compression wave from the explosion was powerful enough to shatter glass more than a block away. The ceiling collapsed on the store manager, Colleen Begelm, who was buried in debris. Luckily, no one was in the back of the store where the blast occurred. Colleen escaped the debris and everyone in decor and Woody's made it out to the street with minor injuries. Outside, everyone was accounted for, but the fire raged on. While the fire chiefs were driving to the site of the explosion, the alarms began blaring at the fire stations and the firefighters jumped into their engines and headed out. Firefighter Mike McCandless was driving one of the fire engines that was first on the scene. By the time we got around the corner to decor, there was brick scattered throughout the street and people were running from buildings, getting in their cars and leaving. There was a big column of smoke at the back of the building. We pulled up, set our ladder up, and started throwing water on it. When the firefighters arrived, they examined the fire. It was clear that the fire was fed by pressure and gas. The most obvious scenario was a break in the local gas line. The firefighters contacted the local utility company and told them that a line was broken and requested that the gas be turned off. The company immediately shut off the gas in a two block radius surrounding the fire, but nothing happened. The fire still raged communicating to the utility company that there was still gas and the utility company assured them that the gas was cut off. The utility company sent personnel to the site and after shutting off the gas to a wider area, they realized that this fire was not coming from a leak in the local utility system. This was something else. No one knew where it was coming from or why. Initially, there were no other accidents, so there were no other emergencies. They blocked off the area and focused on the issue at hand. 
However, because they didn't know the origin of the gas and why it had caught fire, they couldn't rule out it happening at other locations. The unknown caused great worry around the small town. Later that evening, a geyser erupted, spewing mud and rock 30 feet into the air. The geyser erupted three miles from the site of the explosion. Furthermore, the ground began to sink at some locations. In other locations around town, the ground cracked open and briny water spewed from the cracks. This sent the town into a panic. No one could predict when or where the next fire or the next explosion would occur. First responders were flying around town from one location to the next trying to figure out what was going on. It was clear that there was a huge well of natural gas that spanned miles across inside and outside of the city. But where was it coming from? And how was it getting to the surface? And most importantly, where would it erupt next? The firefighters and engineers also discovered that the gas that was being released by the ground was unprocessed natural gas, mostly methane. This natural gas is an odorless, combustible gas. Before natural gas is transported for commercial and personal use, it undergoes an odorization process, where a chemical odorant is injected into the gas. The odorant is typically mercaptan, made up of carbon, hydrogen, and sulfur, giving the gas a foul, rotten egg-type smell. This odorant is added to odorless combustible gases as the smell is easily recognizable. Anyone in their homes or industry will recognize the smell and know immediately if there is a gas leak or if they have simply left a burner on in their kitchen. The natural gas that was released from the ground in Hutchinson did not have an odor. This provided further evidence that the gas was not from a public system. More importantly, this also meant that the gas was undetectable without sensing equipment leaving the vast majority of citizens wondering if their homes might be next. The sun rose on January 18th with the first responders battling the ongoing blaze downtown. At this point, it was believed that the emergency personnel, along with geologists and KGAS, would soon have the fires under control, so the town went to work and the children went to school as usual. That morning, at the Big Chief Mobile Home Park, John and Mary Hahn, like everyone else, woke up and went about their day. Little did they know that a crack had opened beneath their home. This event in itself was not necessarily life-threatening, as the gas would most likely have spread out along the ground. However, the Hans mobile home had a skirt during the winter months to trap in heat. This skirt also trapped the gas that built up below and in their home. As this gas had no odor, John and Mary Hahn had no way of knowing that the natural gas was building up. It is believed that they lit their stove in an attempt to cook. The spark from igniting their flame ignited the gas causing a huge explosion that mortally injured the couple. They were transported to the hospital where they would both die from their injuries. This second major blast threw the town into a panic. Now the idea of a blast happening somewhere else in town wasn't just speculation, it was real. The authorities evacuated a two-mile radius around the mobile home park. Children were sent home and schools were closed. People left their jobs and closed up businesses to be with their families. For the people of Hutchinson, one of their fellow citizens' homes had exploded, and there was no way of knowing if theirs might be next. All the while, more and more gas was building up under the city. On Wednesday morning, January 17th, as the explosion downtown was taking place, seven miles to the northwest at the Yagi Underground Natural Gas Storage Facility, there was a dramatic pressure drop in the S1 jug, which held approximately 60 million cubic feet of gas. The Yagi storage field had 62 jugs in total, holding 3.5 billion cubic feet of gas at pressures of approximately 600 pounds per square inch. The S1 jug was below an impermeable layer preventing the gas from reaching the surface. So the question was, how was the gas escaping? When the pressure dropped, Kansas Geological Survey engineer Saibal Bhattacharya did some quick estimations and found that it should take at least a few days for gas from the S1 jug to filter through the ground rock to Hutchinson, and the S1 jug had been filled and pressurized three days before the explosion. Based on this information, and when it was realized that the gas was not from a local line, K-Gas engineers knew there must be a leak in the S1 storage facility. Though the origin of the gas was known fairly early on, there was no way of quickly determining where pockets were forming under the city. To control the gas, the pressure needed to be released in a controlled fashion. K 
K-Gas drilled down in various strategically chosen locations. However, initially 36 wells were drilled and only 8 struck gas. They were drilling blind. They set up flares to vent the gas that was found in the initial 8 sites, but knew that there were more. If they could find out how the gas was traveling from the S1 jug to the city, then they could more easily locate the gas pockets. They sent a camera down the gas supply line of the S1 jug and found a large slice in the pipe at approximately 600 feet. The gas leaked from the S1 through the hole in the pipe and somehow made its way to town, finding old brine wells where it was released to the surface. There was a map of old brine wells that had been drilled at various locations around town, but this did not include unknown wells. For example, excavation of the site below Decor and Woody's later revealed an old brine well that had been sealed up. The well had previously been drilled to provide salt water to a hotel spa. There were many of these known and unknown wells around town, so they now knew how the gas was getting to the surface. The final question still remained, how was the gas getting from S1 to the wells? KGS ran a four mile long seismic reflection line between the Yagi facility and town. It was found that the gas was moving along under a substantially impermeable dolomite layer with a permeable shell layer above the dolomite. The best conclusion to date is that the dolomite layer must have fractures releasing the gas into the shell layer, though these fractures have never directly been observed. More flares were posted venting off the gas, which was almost entirely methane. NASA flew two methane detecting missions over the city to see if there were any unknown gas vents. They didn't find any, and the city was declared safe on March 29, 2001. Upon this declaration, the last of the evacuees were allowed to return home more than two months after they were evacuated. The quick action in reducing pressure and preventing more explosions by KGS and KGAS has been praised. If it wasn't for their quick response, there certainly would have been more explosions and potentially more deaths. Since this event in 2001, no gas has been found to be emitting from the ground in Hutchinson, Kansas. This is True Mysteries. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.